Uh, it's Gadget UK here again, um, just doing the follow on uh, part of the repair here to my Commodore 1084S uh, D1 monitor. As you can see, all my caps have arrived here. Uh, I'm going to start by replacing the 400 volt, uh, 150 microfarad cap here. Um, throughout this video, I'm going to be talking about various things. There's loads of things I forgot to mention in the previous video, some of which I had on a list to remind myself to, to, you know, to go through and uh, to talk about in this video. But others were things that people have prompted me and reminded me about and stuff in the comments on the, the first video. Uh, and one of them was to do with safety. Um, I think one person was uh, a bit upset that perhaps hadn't um, emphasised that you know some of the lower DC voltages are just as fatal, if not more fatal, than the HT voltage yet yeah, you can still kill yourself on the, the DC voltages that was a, a fair comment that I should have mentioned um, you know some of the lower DC voltage like the ones on this cap you know this cap when it's on the board uh, will hold about 370 ish volts so even when the th system is powered off you take the board out you know you touch the contacts underneath you could get uh, you know potentially you know if you touch one on each hand like that the, the charge can go straight through your body, straight through your heart, potentially. And it's all about current. Uh, you know, the whole risk of having a heart attack and killing yourself and sort of stopping your heart. It's all to do with current. So before I take the back off here, it's just something else I thought I'd show you. Um, in that previous video there, where this piece here was snapped off the, uh, you know, the, the, the very tip there of the switch, it wasn't latching. So what I think it, someone had done is tucked it under the edge of the uh, plastic here. I think it was almost like deliberately broken off. And I could have left it on that way because whilst I demonstrated it going off and on and off and I couldn't get it to stay on, what you could do and the way it shipped to me is it was pushed in, like I say, and pushed to the side. So it was like hooked onto the inside here. So that's probably um, a technique you could use to avoid replacing the switch. And I do think that that had been done deliberately. It was no accident that the tip had broken off. I think someone had deliberately done that. Um, so you can see some of the other controls and inputs and stuff on the back, we've got an RGB input here. That was something I didn't think to mention at the time, is when I talked about this being factory locked to PAL via the delay line and stuff, um, and a crystal perhaps, uh, yeah that's true, but RGB obviously has got no colour encoding stuff going on, so uh, you know it's just your raw uh, RG analog RGB lines there so yeah um, RGB is a good way to get around the whole uh, region thing you know so like when I come to later use my Super Famicom I'm guessing uh, I should be able to just wire up a, a, a relevant cable and um, what I'll probably do is get uh, the 9 pin uh, you know, a D-type uh, connector here and have it go to a SCART female connector. Um, uh, that should work, I think, for the most part. So, yeah, I'm only, I don't know that I'm going to need any resistors and things in there. I'm not sure what this is expecting, like probably TTL levels or something, I'm not sure. Um, so we've got a button here for CVBS. Uh, I can't even tell. I'm gonna, I probably need to come back for these. You've got one there as well, CVBS RGB. So, yeah, composite RGB. It might be to do with the sink, one of those might be to do with the sink, I'm not sure. You can see the CVBS L, uh, CVBS uh, slash L, I'm not sure what the dash slash L is. But yeah, that's your composite, that's your composite input. Uh, and then you've got uh, audio L, that one's audio R as you can see there, and then we've got a chroma input there. Um, so I'm guessing you could perhaps have chroma and luminance, yeah the L's going to be luminance. So you could have luminance and chroma uh, going in there as well. Um, which is nice. Um, yeah, there's an analog TTL. Oh, there we go. That may answer my own question. You've got an analog TTL button there, which is going to dictate the the level input there, I think. Um, and then we've got vertical shift, vertical size, horizontal size. So one of the main things people commented about on the uh, previous video actually was the anode cap here. Uh, you know, and the fact uh, that the tube um, will store all that uh, power uh, even when it's switched off. You know, like weeks later. You've probably still got like 24 kilovolts in there in that tube um, and in order to remove the main board here from the rest of the chassis you know you, you obviously do need to disconnect that um, so the way I've always done this in the past is the first thing is make sure you've got um, a proper earth connection so measure from your earth connection uh, obviously this is only going to apply to UK uh, users here uh, but yeah uh, European perhaps where you've got you know an earth connection there but yeah I'll typically check on my multimeter to make sure I've got um, a good earth connection on this mains lead plug it into the socket switch the socket off switch the unit off and on just to make sure I've got no power I've definitely disengaged the power and I, uh, you know and from there on in I'll check um, I also check to make sure we've got a connection from here to an area of the chassis so here 
for example I'll be very very surprised if that's not earthed you can see the connection there actually um, and it's always also worth checking this make sure they're really tight that should be super tight if that's you ever find one where that's loose that's the first thing you should do is tighten that up um, so we've got an earth you know we'll have an earth pass through there to the uh, you know the main socket we've definitely not got power engaged just check that first before you do anything and then you need a pretty thick cable it's got to sustain about five amps I think something around that I usually use like an old multimeter probe um, connect a crocodile clip to it stick it on here so the cables crimped on I've got one somewhere I just can't find it right now so you, you've got your crocodile clip there you've got the cable coming off on the other end of the cable you have another cr uh, crocodile clip you know a um, crocodile thing stick it on your screwdriver like that plastic handle um, I always wear rubber gloves that's another thing uh, someone else mentioned that but I always wear rubber gloves when I'm doing anything to do with the EHT side even though I'm holding a plastic isolated handle I will take no risks whatsoever keep your left hand you know sort of like behind you or in your pocket or something just use your right hand because you get an electric shock through your left hand that's the side where your heart's on so it'll go you know up your arm through your heart down your leg kind of thing um, whereas if you get a shock on the <clears throat> you know using your right hand it's more likely to just go down your, the right hand side of your body provided your left arm is not touching anything you know that's earthed etc otherwise you could go across your right arm through your abdomen you know through your left arm so yeah rubber glove on let's say you've got this uh, you know connected via a wire to here effectively you're not touching anything then you simply uh, I'm not going to completely show you this you know but you lift the the HT cap here and shove the screwdriver up on the underside and just gradually until you're a massive arc you're a massive crack um, and that's that's discharged now that's perhaps not the best way of doing things it's a similar thing with capacitors you, you, you can use that same approach but you should have perhaps something like I think uh, if memory serves a one meg resistor and obviously it's got to be of certain current capability otherwise you'll just b blow the resistor out probably um, but yeah, uh, I have a one meg resistor in series with that, that wire um, and then you'll still hear a spark but you'll need to keep it there for a period of minutes probably you know, just to let it drain, make sure it's completely drained and then <coughs> you can move the cap but even then, don't use your bare fingers have rubber gloves on um, and then maybe, you know, you could even just after you've finished removing it, just ground it again you know, just do it a second time again making sure you're totally isolated and you've got your earth connected and stuff because it's got to have a path back to earth that's the main thing um, but I'm not going to do that right now because like I say first of all I just want to swap out that single cap there I don't need to remove the board and it's risky and I just don't like doing it um, coming back to my point there about using a resistor it's the same thing with caps you know people sh you know the tendency um, all the engineers I worked around the, the tendency was to take a cap uh, I can't find one right now I did have one floating around here somewhere but like oh there it is yeah take a cap for example that's mounted on the board so you can see the contacts coming through the board it's a similar thing touch the two contacts together and you'll see a spark as it completely discharges you know hold it there just for a second or two because these will recharge you know if you just do it briefly you usually see a spark if you measure it there you'll probably still see a voltage um, it creeps back up a little bit not you know not a lot but you know maybe 30 40 volts uh, so yeah just give it time um, and then you know that, that's safe to work on as well because th that was the other thing that like, some, some people were suggesting some of the other DC voltages in here you know like from the switching side are just as lethal if not more lethal than the HT side you can get you know high high uh, DC shocks from some of the caps on here you know especially that one the 400 volt one let's say 370 odd volts um, stored in that cap when it's off it's probably there now if I turn this over in fact I'll do that as I turn it over in a minute we'll just measure it uh, before I fit this one we'll just see if there's anything still in there so as you can see we're on uh, volts DC let's just measure across there yeah you can see that that's drained actually um, had that just been on like a minute ago it would still be a voltage just dropping there there's probably a resistor across that uh, in fact I can see it there I think um, yeah there's probably a resistor uh, across that which has drained it after a, you know, a few minutes but typically like I say it's not unusual switch it off start working on the board there could be 250-300 volts there easily at least but right now it's totally safe um, and as I say, you know, the technique uh, would be to, uh, was it gone down the cap, just short across there like that, you know, you'll see a spark. Uh, but again, it's, you should use a resistor. I actually think that probably damages, this is potential there, potential there to damage the capacitor. I've never seen it happen myself, but, uh, you know, when I, whenever, whenever I've done that technique, as I've been shown by previous engineers, um, I've always wondered if there was if it was better perhaps to just use a resistor, and it, it is. I'm sure, you know, you, it would last longer if you used a resistor. But 
uh, yeah, comments down below, please. Let me you know. Let me know what you think. Do you just short them out? Do you use a resistor to you know drain them over a few minutes, etc.? What do you think is the best approach? So just looking at the old cap here, you can see it's a Samyung, uh, 150 microfarad, 400 volts. Um, now I'll comment on this as well, one of my uh, commenters said, oh, the first thing they would have done is swapped out this cap because it's domed. Um, that's not unusual, can you see, like that one's flat. I guarantee after that's been used just for several hours, that top will just slightly dome like that. That's what they always do, the plastic expands and you know you get a very slight dome there. So even on a really good, perfect working cap, um, with these ones, the plastic top, you can just see just a very slight curve. Can you see that? It's just ever so subtle. It's not a lot. Um, yeah, it might not do it on this one because it's made of newer materials, but it's not uncommon to see them like that, and they'll be fine. You can test the ESR, they'll be fine. Um, yeah, so, you know, that can be a red herring. You can't always just assume you need to swap out uh, that type of, uh, you know, cap when it's just got that slight angle to the top there. Um, and as you can see, this one's marked 85 degrees C. The replacement I've gone for here is a 105 degrees C. Um, I've gone with a Nippon Chemicon, um, and it's uh, you know it's got a good ESR. This is uh, you know like a optimal for switch mode power supplies and things like that. Um, so yeah, hopefully that should do the trick. Just got to get it, get it the right way around. But it's surprising, you know, it's a lot shorter. Um, it's amazing how things have come along. Really, it's got the right uh, snap uh, space in there. You know the pitch. So we've got no problems mounting that. But yeah, so I'll stick that on there next. So I might uh, disconnect the uh, anode later. Um, just right now, like I say, I just want to swap out this uh, this one cap here, just to see what difference uh, this has actually on its own. Um, I will be swapping out some of the others anyway, even if it, if it works perfectly. If it works perfectly with this cap now, uh, I'll be going round some of the others and certainly measuring them. Um, but uh, yeah, any in key uh, locations there, like the one on the. Uh, line output side and the vertical I'll be swapping out anyway and some of the higher voltage ones you know there's a couple of uh, 103, 160 volt caps on here that uh, I will swap out uh, regardless of whether the one or not but yeah that's not too bad I'll just clean that up and uh, we'll just give it a quick test so we've still got the, the sink issue and it still looks a bit green when you first switch it on despite having swapped out the main uh, ballast cap as you can see about that so I'm going to disconnect the, uh, you know, discharge the anode here. Um, so I've got a cable here, um, it should be thick enough, that's going to hold about, take, carry about 5 amps. Um, I've got one of these uh, clips here, that was thanks to Alison Shalice actually, that was one of the things she had in her component tray. So uh, and I'm doing this on the table, um, this is not the sort of thing I would do on the floor, seriously not. Because you're nearer to earth, it's like, and I'm in a conservatory here. Uh, God knows what the uh, people did when they built this. Is the earth really deep enough? Is it connected to the main earth? Is it just like below the floor I'm standing on here? You know, I'd hate to, uh, you know, get <laughs> get a shock or something. So, um, yeah, I'm going to wear some rubber soled shoes in here. Um, as you can see, I'm connected to the chassis with that end of the cable, and I've checked uh, the power connector there just to make sure it is. You know, we've got earth passing all the way through that. The, you know, the middle pin all the way to the mains outlet. Uh, I'll connect the mains lead up, uh, as I say, make sure it's switched off at the socket, test the power, just to make sure it doesn't, you know, have definitely not got power there. Um, and then the final thing I've done here is just clean up uh, with uh, some sandpaper the uh, blade on the screwdriver there, and we'll clip the other clip on there. It's not a very good fit, but it should be all right. Um, and I'll get some rubber gloves on. I am taking no chances whatsoever, and I'll wear rubber gloves, left hand behind my back, and then we'll slide that up there, uh, so you can't quite see that, can you? Yeah, we'll slide that up there, I'll use the rubber gloves just to lift the end, and we'll uh, short it to earth, just bear with me. So, rubber sold shoes on, uh, power off, just do a test. Yeah, completely discharged. We know we've got ground, like I said, I've tested that. The ground does pass through the earth pin there, straight to the socket. So, there we go, I hate this, I'm actually dreading this. So my left hand is by my back, uh, I've got my rubber glove on, uh, got my, oh shit, uh, flaky crocodile uh, assembly here. Should just be a case, uh, just listen. Nothing, I'm quite surprised. I wonder if this is one of these ones that discharges itself.
Yeah, so there was no crack, no spark, no nothing. So let's just do some continuity tests here uh, to my cable. Yeah, so my cable's all right. You probably you can't see this, but uh, see if we can just hook that in there somewhere. Yeah, so if we check to the clip, we've got ground there. Let's just clip it on here. Just test that. Yeah, let's just test the tip. Yeah, so definitely all earthed. Let's say so. Left hand behind the back. Uh, I'll just pull you back up again. That's just to be double, double extra sh safe here. And yeah, nothing. I'm just quite surprised at that, to be fair. So I think uh, what I'll do now is use my right hand and try and disconnect the cap. Yeah, there you go. So you can see that's disconnected. And just to be extra safe here, let's just let's do that. Yeah, very little. Very little. So quite surprising. Usually you get ma a massive crack. You know, uh, I mean, like a really large crack. Um, I'm quite surprised. But the main thing is I've been able to disconnect, disconnect the anode here now. So uh, as soon as I remove the glue from there, I can actually pull the backboard off and just get the whole the whole board out. I want to have a good inspection of the board as I can go around and replace some of the caps. Uh, and then what I'll probably do is just put the back on the, the monitor here just to make sure that that cap there is not uh, exposed in any kind of way that where some, someone or an animal or something could uh, come in contact because it might still hold a bit of a charge, I might even just, just give it one, one last go here. Uh, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing. Could be the resistance, can you see it's quite warm on there. I'm just wondering if um, we did have a connection and it discharged gradually because of the resistance on the end of the tip. That's, uh, that's a possibility. Um, so I'm sweating just with anxiety here actually having, uh, having just uh, done that. Uh, but we'll try, and if we can, um, cut away at this just to free it up. And then we should be able to get the, the neck off just gently. You don't want to obviously damage any connections and things, but there you go. Can you see that? Oop. There we go, that's off. Just connect, disconnect that ground. There's a ground there on the back, as you can see uh, here on the back of that. Um, so in theory, I think this board should come out now, and then we can, uh, yeah, there's going to be connectors at the front, so you can see this, probably up for the LED and uh, things like that, in the front, yeah, that's, that's disconnect that, there's one around that side there, that's disconnect that, next to the RGB bias adjustments there, so you can adjust the uh, the bias of the RGB there, and I think, uh, yep, yeah, we're nearly there, there's just one connector here for the uh, deflection coils, let's just Disconnect that. Is there anything else attached to the chassis here? I'm not sure. Yeah, the degauss. Let's just disconnect the degauss. And I think, hopefully, yeah, we're free now. So, like I say, I'll put that board to the side, uh, and then I'm just going to carefully just uh, put this, uh, you know, put the back on here, and just, uh, you know, just keep it safe and keep animals and things away from it. Yeah, so from my perspective, uh, pleasantly disappointing. Uh, yeah, I, I can understand people perhaps wanting to see a bit of, uh, you know, the, the correct reaction there that you normally see with the, the massive crack. Um, but I think it's, maybe it's just this monitor discharges itself. Um, yeah, it's looking a bit dirty. We'll clean the underside of that as well. Um, it's important you don't clean around the actual tube itself. and you know, You've got to use the right things. You can't just wipe around there because they're painted with a specific... Uh, type of uh, material there just to isolate various bits and stuff and I think some of the actual outs the coating around the tube itself was actually grounded you know you've got a ground connection there on the outer part so but around the anode uh, cap there there's another type of paint so you've got to be careful when you you know you're cleaning these things just dust them basically uh, but you can clean the the rubber connector there you know that is just filthy as you can see that's that's not going to help with things and uh, yeah the contacts look all right but as you can see the way it works that little hole that's on the back of the neck there those uh, you know um, you know just squeeze together a little bit and you can you can get it back in um, 
but uh, the main thing is now like so we can uh, see all of the caps and things on here um, whilst we're looking at the netboard here I'll just point out a few other things there's usually in fact I can see them now three transistors on the netboard here one two three there's gonna be one for driving each color so sometimes you can be missing a color uh, and if it's not a problem with the input side of things it, more often than not it's one of these transistors has failed or the, uh, the fact there's probably a couple of transistors for each one uh, you can see the smaller ones there there's like probably like a pair of those with each one or something at least um, so yeah one of those transistors could have failed um, or one of the supporting components there's going to be some resistors and things and maybe a cap associated with each uh, one as well at some point on there so yeah that's not uncommon uh, I have had that before where one of those transistors fails and you replace it and it works and you test it for a number of hours and everything's fine and a number of months go by and then it fails again the same colour, the same gun, the same transistor comes back I think there's a problem with the tube I think there's uh, I, I, you know, I, I, this is a mystery I never got to the end of some of the more experienced people out there who've worked on a lot of tubes and things might be able to post in the comments down below but I'm guessing that something goes wrong with one of the guns maybe you just get the odd arc or something going on inside there or something where the current just shoots up just for for no apparent reason I don't well an apparent reason I don't know what that reason is and I reckon that's what makes that particular transistor keep failing yeah I've only seen that a couple of times but I just thought I'd mention it as I say you know generally if you've got a missing colour it's going to be something on one of those it could be um, on the actual set of like the inputs I don't know there's going to be some chips and things on here maybe it might be that I don't know it could be that um, to do, even no that's just a 4066 isn't it I've got a gold star chip there but yeah there's going to be a, a chip on there at least for handling the RGB side of things and stuff um, and the composite side of things. I think that's a delay line, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think that's a delay line. Um, you know, to do the PAL, uh, the PAL uh, colour burst there. Are these regulators? I'm not sure. I think they might be. I think we might have a couple of regulators there. I'll have a closer look at those in a minute, but uh, I'll also have a quick zoom in on that just to see if it is a TDA or is it an STK or something. I think it's a TDA. So on the power supply side of things, I'll straighten up this cap. It doesn't look completely flat there. I'll just make sure that's properly on because I was soldering it sideways on. Uh, and I'm going to replace the three small electrolytics you can just about see um, around there just to make sure those are okay. Um, I'll swap out these two 160 uh, volt, 100 microfarad caps here. Uh, this one over here. Uh, and then I think I'm going to swap out the ones around here as well. Um, I've already done that one down there. Uh, you can see, and I'll mark the tops of these just so it's clear which ones I've swapped out. And I'll probably also swap out these two down here as well. Uh, I think I've got replacements for those. Um, so then I've just got some of the smaller ones to consider. You know, maybe some of these smaller ones around the board might be an issue. Um, yeah, I'll probably swap out that one down there as well. I think that's connected to the line output transformer, actually. Uh, you know, those two. Um, but I'm just going to go through them and do them anyway. Um, might need to do this one, I'm not sure just yet. So I'm going to do those 160 volt caps. Yeah, just making sure they are not uh, charged and it doesn't appear so. Sometimes when you've got a lot of uh, ground playing like that there. The best way to do it actually is to you know, free one side and then heat and pull the cap from the other side of the board, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Um, I might just be able to see this. Yeah, I'll heat. Uh, see, that side there is free pretty much. You should be able to move that cap. Yeah, I can. It's come out on that side. Uh, and then just heat this side. And then once it gets up to temperature, I should be able to feel it move and just pull it out. And then I can unblock the hole. Sorry, you can't quite see that, can you? I'm just off camera a little bit yeah there you go it's coming out and obviously the glue can be an issue on these as well I can feel there's a bit of glue on that one on the other side uh, holding it on if I just turn this over carefully yeah and as you can see it's held on by a bit of glue there so yeah sometimes cutting off uh, from the other side is better and you can see we've got like a little wet mark there that just to me indicates that it probably has leaked or something at some point that cap so the interesting thing again here is these are 85 degrees C and I'm replacing them with 105 degrees so hopefully these will last a bit longer and the, you know, the good ESR on these are designed for uh, this particular uh, purpose here. So I've made sure I've got it the right way around with respect to positive and negative. Uh, there we go. So snip those off, uh, clean that up. 
so working away around the power supply section here, I don't know if you can see we found, uh, I think, a dry joint there. Can you see? Uh, just at the bottom, it looks like it's sort of separated from the pad a bit there. That's a better angle. So, yeah, I need to reflow that. So I'm getting ready to retest this now. Uh, you can see all the ones I've swapped out. I've put a little green mark on. Um, so I, I, there's two there, two 22 microfarad 50 volts. So those probably need swapping out. So I'm going to order some replacements for those. And there's also a cap over here that I didn't have a spare for. 250 volts, one microfarad. I'm guessing that's going to be for one of the uh, deflection coils here. So again, that uh, probably needs swapping out. Now there's loads of small ones that I haven't done. Uh, I have gone through and done all the ones sort of about 100 microfarads upwards. Um, anything that's quite large, you know, certainly higher voltage ones. You can see all the ones down here. Uh, I'm just going to do those two they're on the audio i suspect they're on the output side of this because you've got a couple of uh, look like sort of op amp type things here it's right next to the audio input i'm guessing that's probably uh what those are going to be for uh if i'm honest so the sound's okay at the moment probably don't need doing but i'm going to do them anyway because i've got some spares uh i probably would need to order a spare for that as well i think it's 47 microfarad 160 volts so it'll be interesting to see with all the caps i've replaced what behaviour we get, and the dry joint that I pointed out was on one of these resistors down here, I forget which one it was, it was on one of those resistors, it could have been that one, I'm not sure. Um, so we did have a dry joint there as well. Um, so yeah, it'll just be interesting to see. So I'll reassemble it, I'll show you me reconnecting the uh, uh, anode here, and uh, yeah, hope I don't kill myself. So something worth uh, just showing you here, I've removed a cap there from C is that 239 uh, and you can see there's no positive negative designation it's uh, a bipolar cap uh, I'll show you if I can find the damn thing uh, yeah it's in the uh, cap meter at the moment there's no marking on the can yeah so that's a, a clue that it's uh, bipolar I've measured it it's uh, shown about five microfarads so it's you know uh, and I don't have a spare for this moment so I'll stick it back in but I think I'm going to need to order one of those those bipolar caps nearly always cause a problem with these uh, monitors actually so I'm about to reassemble this, I'm just going to clean around here with a bit of IPA. Uh, it's perhaps not the best thing to use with the rubbers and silicons and things, but it should be alright. It's not going to damage it just for this short period here of cleaning this. Um, and it will evaporate, which is the good thing, but you, you want to clear off any of that black shit off there, because that will, uh, you know, uh, contribute to, like, arcing and things like that if you're not careful. Uh, but yeah, we'll just uh, gently wipe that, just make sure there's no particles in it. Perhaps just blow it with some uh, air should do I think and we'll do the same on the outside while we're here as well actually so just to show you I did uh, swap out a fair few of the caps I've got one more I'm just going to do there now actually before I uh, stick it in the chassis uh, but I think I think uh, for the moment I'm happy with all the ones I've done I've done one or two uh, you know sort of uh, around here as well actually uh, as you can see um, but yeah I'll definitely need to swap out that one I think that's the uh, bipolar 4.7 so those two that's, you know, I think they're going to be related to the, the deflection there, so if we've still got a, some sort of frame or something, you know, flicker anything going on, it, that, it's going to be those two, I think one of those two, uh, and the two 22 microfarads uh, there on the power supply, and that could still give us a low voltage level, so we might not see any improvement having swapped out all of these, which, uh, well, I hope not, I hope we do see some improvement, but yeah, those, those two in particular on the switching power supply side there uh, could be a big part of the problem on this. I should have perhaps tried to avoid the little scratches as you can see there from the screwdriver. That perhaps wasn't uh, my best uh, attempt at removing one of these, but you've got to remember the last time I did this was, oh, I don't know, about 25 years ago or something daft. Um, so I think uh, the way I'm going to do this is just move all my wires and things out of the way, ready if I can. Uh, just get the board in approximately the right position. Let's see if I can just pull you back a bit and point you down perhaps. Um, I've cleaned the underneath of this board pretty thoroughly uh, in wherever I've uh, removed a cap and stuff, replaced a cap. Um, I'm just going to move it approximately the right position. I need to slide it across the grooves. Can you see that? There's little grooves there. So we'll slide it in as far as I can get it. I'll perhaps just connect these front connectors because they're going to be really hard to do once it's a certain distance in there. Yeah, so that's about as far as I want to take it for now, I think. Um, and then we'll take the anode. I'll put my rubber glove back on again. Yeah, so the HT cap is going to go up here 
like this. Uh, so in order to do this I'm going to pull it back like that to expose the prongs. Can you see that? Using, let's say, the hand with the rubber glove. Uh, very carefully, if I can. Very carefully. Connect it back in there like that. And that side, can you see that's connected? And let go of the cap and then just perhaps just move this around a little bit. Centralise it. That's okay, I think. And then we can just uh, gradually uh, slide this forward a bit, start to reconnect things, put the uh, deflection coils back on. Uh, let's get the uh, base of the board and this uh, ground strap back on. I think that's what this is, this black wire here, it'll see it's the ground for the uh, chassis. Uh, this is usually a ground band that goes right around the tube, it's probably that I think. So that's back on there, let's stick the ground on. That's it. The ground connection to make sure the base is firmly on. Uh, so the degauss coil is uh, just down here. So I don't think you can get that round the wrong way. I think it's from memory. I was thinking about this last night. I think it's something like half mains potential goes around there. Could be wrong. Um, yeah, post in the comments below if you uh, remember or know more. Um, so the tricky bit now is to try and that's it. Slide that right in. So let me turn it around and then I'll just give a, a once over inspection just to make sure that everything looks alright there um, and then I'll get the back on and we'll power it up so I'm not connected to anything at the moment just power cable the back is just loosely held on with one screw just to uh, yeah, stop anything exploding out everywhere uh, let's try it that's a good sign it didn't bang right okay switch it off let me connect uh, the nez up I think. Find the power switch, where's it gone? Let's power it on now with the nez. I think the volume's maxed out. Yeah, the volume's pretty loud. So you can see we've still got a frequency issue there, and I think it's gonna be those uh, caps. In fact it's still looking a bit green. It could be the green screen thing. Yeah, that's right, we've got colour back. Um, yeah, so it's just a, we've got a frequency thing, just a flickering thing there. And I think that's the ones on the vertical, on the deflection. Those two caps there, there's going to be a bipolar 4.7. Uh, and I think just near there, there was uh, another cap actually that was, um, I can't remember the exact size of it, but I've written them down. So, yeah, we're getting there. Um, at least it's not completely green like it was. I mean, you've got a good level of green there, but these things tend to be... Um, tweaked in such a way that you get um, you know, a strong green level generally. Green is the colour that we're most susceptible to, you know, our eyes uh, are more um, sensitive towards green, but you can see the reds there, so we'll just give that a few minutes, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit better, sorry, it's not, it's not focusing very well though, is it? Is it because I've been in front of the thing? I'm not sure. Yeah, and I do think it is, I think it's vertical deflection, I think that's the only problem we've got now. It's not like it's green like it was and stuff, and there's none of that stuff going on, and the, pic the, the frame is not collapsed really, it's just, the, the frame is intermittently collapsing a little bit there now, from that, uh, probably that 4.7 microfarads bipolar cap. Um, it's only been on two minutes now, if you just watch that, it's starting to stabilise. Um, and it just looks a lot better in general, the colours are a lot better. Um, it feels a bit sharper and stuff as well actually. Um, but yeah, you can see it's just flicking a little bit there now. Give it another minute, it'll, it'll stabilise. So I'll order those other caps. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a part three to this video, I think. Um, I'm hoping we've not got another fault here, like, you know, maybe something glitchy in the tube side of things. You know, I'm not that hot on uh, understanding some of the stuff to do with the tube. So after about five minutes there, it's, uh, it's pretty good, actually. Um, so those caps have made a significant difference, actually, to the picture and the time takes to uh, eat up. Oh, we've got a green tinge there, can you see that? Yeah, do you notice that? I think we've got a cap, there's another cap there he's doing. Um, I wouldn't have been able to spot that before until now, but uh, having swapped out so many of the other caps, it's evident that the cap related to switch there's a cap there related on the circuit there to do with green screen um, and as you can see as you switch over 
you get your colour back and it's really vibrant actually and then it starts to fade to like a green sort of colour so we've yet another cap there related to that part of the circuit I might have to um, have a look on the board there see if I can follow uh, and maybe the schematics try and understand um, what uh, cap that might be but uh, yeah definitely we answered the whole green issue there um, it's a uh, pain in the ass this monitor it seriously is I think it's like I say I think in retrospect I think every single cap should more or less be swapped out on this um, but I've got the most most of most of them now there's just a couple on the vertical which will solve that issue when you first switch it on there um, I couldn't find a bipolar cap at 4.7 microfarads but what you can do is you can make a bipolar cap uh, I think you join from memory you join the negatives of the two caps together and actually after a further four or five minutes there you can see that green issue stop being a problem so uh, whatever cap was causing that is now not an issue it's interesting like I say they've replaced so many of the caps we, it could still be related to the supply lines and things I don't think so though um, yeah you see that was looking very green that room before um, I don't think I caught it on camera but trust me it was um, the green on the right hand side was just making everything really green um, I don't think it's a tube issue, it, it did seem to be related to the green screen option, you know, switch it off and then back on and it would go, you know, the colours would be like that there and then they would start to fade and go green again as if you'd uh, switched it back on um, but yeah, making significant progress here now um, just not 100% just yet And actually on the default colour setting it's, uh, it's looking a lot better there as well, it's like we've got more colour, can you see that now? It's like the colour range has come back considerably and it's the same with the brightness and contrast although the brightness seems to drop off a bit, that could be the tube as you go, you see it's like there's not much going on right at the top range there and it settles down so yeah that could be the tube uh, maybe the screen adjustment needs tweaking a little bit um, focus seems pretty good this is zigzaggy line here you get this uh, anywhere on this uh, system it's like that on the uh, when I put on a LCD so yeah more caps required I'm sorry there will be part three to this and hopefully it is just going to be electrolytics I hope I haven't got a problem with one of the ceramic caps or something somewhere on the neck board or something I'm not sure about that green thing um, comments down below if you know you know anything about where to look on the, the circuit there um, I honestly w not got a clue this monitor is one of the first I've ever worked on really where it's had a problem like that where you know you get this green tinge and it's related to the switch on the front um, you know to go in between struggling between green and colour I'm guessing it's going to be a cap somewhere um, might not be um, but yeah there's a few other things I want to mention uh, following on from my previous video really and some of it's been influenced by other you know comments and things on that last video so yeah appreciate you know I'm very appreciative of all the comments and things and support I got on that last video um, the, I mentioned you know about the voltage you know mono tube being around uh, 10 kilovolts that's probably a bit inaccurate actually because I was looking back at some of my old notes actually I took when I was uh, you know repairing monitors and it, t it seemed to be around the 8 kilovolts um, rating interestingly enough this has got an Orion tube on it um, this is a Deu model apparently the D um, designates Deu so you've got a D1, a D2, uh, the D2 is slightly different in that well it's got a different layout of board and stuff again it's manufactured by Deu it may have a, an Orion tube on that one as well um, but that model will work with NTSC or PAL as far as I understand I could be wrong correct me below if, uh, if you know otherwise um, but there's a, a P model you know like a P1 I'm guessing there might be a P2 um, and obviously there were, there were models before the D1 and P1 and P2 models etc I think it was just a straight 1080 4 uh, and a 1084S um, so that's interesting I think a lot of those were made by Philips um, I would have preferred like a you know a, a Philips tube or whatever they, they use in those ones but yeah it's not too bad this one it gives uh, quite a reasonable picture and the other thing I forgot to mention in the last video on later monitors uh, not, not something like this like VGA monitors and super VGA monitors etc um, once you got into the realm of power saving you know the energy star energy saving monitors you typically had like a I think it was a Thyristor um, you know, an, an SCR somewhere, like on a heat sink, sometimes attached to a separate piece of the shielding um, with some wires coming off. I think it was like an aftermarket thing initially. They hadn't designed it onto the board, so they, you know, stuck it on some little piece, separate PCB that sat somewhere else in the chassis there. And those used to fail. You know, you, you ever got one of those where it was dead? I think or the LED was just blinking on the front, indicating it's in power save all the time. It was the SCR. 
And another comment from uh, one of my uh, viewers here was uh, using a, uh, an isolation transformer, and that's a very, very good idea. If you're ever going to work on anything high voltage, or even just like power supplies and things in general, uh, it's a good idea to get an isolation transformer. Something else I forgot to mention here as well is you've got your uh, screen voltage and uh, focus adjustments here. So, you know, you'll see that those have got a bit of epoxy or glue or something on them. You can just like crack that off or just tweak them a little bit. So, if your focus is out or your tube is very dull, very, very dark, you can just, you know, pump up the screen uh, voltage a little bit and, you know, play with the focus a little bit there. There's a few things I didn't mention also to do with the, the yoke here. This is what this is called, this assembly here with the deflection cores. That's the yoke. And you can see you've got these little rubber shims and things. Um, the interesting thing with this is, uh, and I wouldn't want to go near adjusting one of these myself, it's just a pain in the arse to do. You can uh, crack off the bits of glue and things, and there's a screw, you see the screw here? You can undo that screw, uh, sorry, I'm off camera as usual, you can undo that screw, and the whole yoke can actually, and all the uh, convergent rings and the purity rings, because that's what those are there, I think the ones nearest the front are probably for purity, and then you've got uh, convergence rings. And I think they work on pairs from what I remember. I think like one will affect like red and blue or red and green. And, and as you go around it, it's pairs of colours. And as you just tweak them, it, you know, obviously it's, it's, uh, there's a mag you know, it's mag got magne uh, magnetic uh, fields, if you like, around this ring. And it, it, it tweaks the, uh, the, the electron uh, angle, if you like, as it, you know, it goes, goes into the tube. So you can just very very fine it's like a fine adjustment for adjusting those in, in pairs strangely enough i'm not, never really understood why that that was why it had to be in pairs um it's probably going to be to do with the way that it's assembled and you've got this like triode uh, or tri yeah it's a triode sort of scenario where it's like a, you know on the screen you get like a, that sort of thing with the the, the, the colour dots, whereas later uh, monitors and things like uh, Trinitron, I think they were in line, you know, they were just in a straight line, um, so they work slightly differently, and I think, you know, obviously there's differences inside the tube to accommodate that, but anyway, yeah, so you can adjust uh, the convergence uh, rings there, you know, like, I've got that little green line down at the side and at the top, so I could, um, I, I'm not just going to wildly do it, I'm gonna, I'd have to look at the uh, service manual first to work out exactly which one of these rings is going to be related to which colour, it's the green that I'm particularly interested in and just tweak them slightly but the problem is you, you you move one and it affects the other so there's a lot of trial and error there but coming back to the whole yoke thing yeah this whole yoke the whole assembly here can slide right off the back of the neck of the tube um, so there's uh, I'm just looking at that there because that little line is it glue I'm not sure um, the orientation of this whole thing if I just uh, pull back a bit the orientation of this whole thing here, you know, you imagine if you twist it like that, it actually turns the picture. So instead of your picture being straight up like that, your picture can go like that. And as you move it away from the back of the tube, it makes your picture go wider, I think. And if you move it further forward, it goes your whole picture goes smaller. So there's a lot of pissing around if you ever take one of these off in order to get your uh, your picture square and at the right, you know, the right place here so that it's filling the picture uh, and it, it just looks okay and the focus the focus could be an issue if you don't get that exactly the right place so there's a lot of analog or analogy sort of things going on when it comes to adjusting one of these of getting everything just dialed in just right um, so yeah again I wouldn't want to do that but yeah back in the day we did have to do that occasionally sometimes we get a, a completely dead tube um, you would have to, you know, let's say do all those things, unscrew this here, remove all the bits of glue, slide it all off, remove your shims. Uh, and these shims play a, a, an important part in terms of getting that distance there and the alignment so that, you, you know, it's totally straight. Because the other thing with this yoke is it's like that now. You could have it like that a little bit or like that a little bit. It's, you know, there's lots of different, there's lots of movement there physically uh, to get just right. And these shims with the glue help get that, you know, to hold it in just the right place when someone's been calibrating this from the factory. And following on from my story about the electrical shot there, yeah, these things can arc. Sometimes, you know, I've seen it, as I saw, an engineer showed me once, uh, we could hear a ticking noise, and I'll talk about that as well, actually. When you get ticking noises or high frequency noises and things coming from, a, you know, a PCB uh, or a transformer, you're trying to work out where it's from, don't start sticking your ear anywhere near the thing to try and work out where it's from. Get yourself one of those, you know, that plastic hose stuff you can get for fish, you know, fish tanks, you know, for the... Uh, the air, circuit, air pumps and for water pumps and you also have them these days uh, quite a lot more commonly available actually for PC cooling um, yeah you know so clear plastic tube get yourself one of those and cut it down to about I don't know a, a foot and a half in length and you can just you know stick your tube over something where you're trying to listen the sound gets funneled down the tube and you can just put the other end of the tube to your ear 
and you can hear, uh, you know, you've got the ability to effectively stick your ear close up to things without actually being next to it. Uh, and you can use that for working out what's ticking, etc. But one of the engineers showed me, um, we had a ticking noise coming from, I forget where it was, it was like, in something like this, but the shielding was like much, much closer to the one of the HT leads, the HT lead here. Uh, and you could just see, every now and again, you get this little tick, and if you switch the lights off, you could see a little blue, uh, spark arcing across so even though these are you know sealed and stuff here never assume that these are safe to get near you know it's not it's not safe to get near any of these sort of things i always like say take the approach if you're going to measure things and stuff do it at a distance um it's not uncommon for in the past for me to have wanted to take readings i'll show you i'll just give you an example you know say for instance you know and there's different approaches i could have took looking at this um you know i've i've gone down the hole let's just see how it goes with caps and things and from experience but you can do more scientific things like you can see there we've got 110 volts marked on the board there uh, 15 volts there's a 30 somewhere 20, 24 volts up there uh, HT so you could you know use uh, the right equipment here to measure various things um, and you need to pay also attention to um, how, how you're you know if you're using a scope uh, the ground of that scope and how it's you know you could destroy your scope uh, I'm not that hot on understanding the principles behind that, and to be honest, for that reason, I've never used my scope on anything like this high voltage. I, you know, I steer well clear of it. Um, it was explained to me many years ago, but uh, yeah, I don't want to take the chance of blowing my scope up. But uh, yeah, you can, you know, you can take measurements and things, you know, on this while it's on, um, and there's various, you know, uh, voltages and things there I should have checked. I'm not that interested in that actually. Because I knew that a large number of caps were going to probably need replacing on this anyway, and that's my would be my next poor call. If after I've swapped the next uh, four or five caps, I need to do that should be it really. If I've still got a problem, then I could perhaps do that. I'll perhaps measure on my DC multimeter uh, one or two of the voltages here when I first power it on to make sure the voltages are okay. At least I can then rule that out. And you also sometimes find small magnets stuck around the tube here. I don't see any on this one. Um, to, again, to deal with imperfections in the tube, uh, you know, maybe the picture's not perfectly square and stuff. Sometimes they can glue on little uh, little uh, magnetic strips and things, and then and they stick a bit of uh, you know, like glue over the top or something to hold them on. Uh, but there don't seem to be any on this, uh, as far as I can see. The other thing I forgot to mention about the degaussing side of things in the last video is if you find you've got like weird colours and things around the edges of the tube or something like that, it looks really weird. What you can do, as, as I've done in the past, is use a, a tape head demagnetizer. You've seen the one I use there for demagnetizing the heads there on uh, 1541 disk drives. I used exactly that demagnetizer, you know, on one of these, and you know, just like stick it in front of the screen here and you just wave it around in circles and pull it away, pull it away, pull it away. The colours are all gone. And then uh, it's a case of just, you know, testing it for a period of time, make sure it's okay but that if you needed to do that it's probably an indication that uh, whatever drives the um, uh, degaussing burst here is faulty uh, I'm guessing it's probably going to be that transformer there I don't know sometimes they had like a little I forget what it's called now it's like a little discrete uh, component you know in a little black sort of plastic body that just sort of sat there and those were often the cause uh, of uh, why the degaussing circuit stopped working. I don't see one on this, so it must work a slightly different way. Uh, I don't know, I think that's a bridge. I think that's just our bridge rectifier down there. Yeah, it will be, got four caps around it as well. So aside from the vertical uh, issue we've still got going here, on here, so aside from the vertical issue we've still got going on here, and I think, like I say, that's going to be related to the two, certainly two of the caps I need to replace there. Um, the um, bipolar cap is going to be one of them. Um, I don't think it's a green issue because you can see we've got red. I think what's actually happening here is the blue is weak until it's warmed up. Uh, now it could be the blue gun on the tube. Um, I don't think so though. I think uh, maybe one of the caps um, that feed the uh, you know the colours through there. Um, a couple of them. Yeah, that's what I think. I'll reassemble it now, uh, just in time my uh, tripod has just broken, <laughs> so uh, yeah I'll need a new tripod but uh, hopefully in the next video we'll uh, get to the bottom of it. Um, anyway hopefully you found that interesting, thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.